to today's WCET and State Authorization Network webcast. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is the NCSERA Data Collection and Reporting webinar. And we will get through lots of content today. Go ahead and move to the next slide. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And I work very closely with Cheryl Dowd, who directs the State Authorization Network. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box. We'll hold those until the end of the presentation, and then we'll be sure to get to as many as we can. At this point, we have almost 550 participants, so we imagine there will be quite a few questions. If you'd like to access the PowerPoint presentation to follow along, you can click on the handout box and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint. Next slide, please. The webinar is being recorded, and we will upload it to the WCET YouTube channel and also make it available on the NC SARA and SAN web pages. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to our moderator for the day, Cheryl Dowd, the director of the State Authorization Network. She's also the WCET and WICHI Cyber Fellow. Please take it away, Cheryl. Thanks, Megan. I appreciate that. I, I'm welcome to all of you. We're very excited to have this much of a, um, a response uh, to what I think is going to be a very informative and helpful webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to have Mary Larson with us today. Mary Larson is the Associate Director for Student and Institution Support with NC SARA, and she will walk through what is required of institutions for the data collection and reporting that is, in the, that is going to be due in the upcoming months. Um, I, I just wanted to check really fast before we move forward. I see that some people are are saying that they aren't seeing the screen. Um, do our panelists see the screen? Um, okay. Cheryl, I do see the screen. Okay, so that's good. Okay, I wanted to make sure that, uh, as Megan mentioned, we are uh, going to save the questions until the end. And when Mary created this presentation, we we recognized that we needed to leave plenty of time for questions. So there will be. But if questions, we don't get through all of the questions, please know that we are able to capture all of the questions and have them answered. And we will post those online. So if we do not get to answer them all verbally today, please know that we have the questions banked and we will have responses to the questions that will be placed on the NC Sarah website and on the WCET website. So we will have a place for that. So we should be in good shape. And I thank those that um, let me know that they can see the screen so we know that technically we're sound and uh, other types of questions we'll save towards the end. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mary and welcome Mary. We're really pleased to have you today and uh, we'll have you go from there. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm go ahead and go to the next slide. I am very excited that we are we are able to partner with WCET and SAN to host this webinar. It's a great opportunity for us to help get the information and to answer many of the questions that I know are out there. I'd like to just remind everybody that if we don't get to your question, please don't hesitate to go ahead and put it in the chat room anyway to, to start with. And if we don't get to it during the webinar today, we will get answers posted on, on our site as well as on the WCET SAN site. Uh, again, just a great big shout out. A thank you to WCET and SAN and Megan and Cheryl for helping us do this. Um, next slide. When we originally launched way back in, July, in January of 2014, we weren't sure how many institutions would be joining over the next few years and how many states. As you can tell right now, we are at um, 48 states as well as the District of Columbia and the US Virgin Islands. One of the questions that always comes up at this point in the slide presentation is the status of the other states that are not yet participating. So I'd like to take a moment and just provide an update with that. Puerto Rico has submitted their certification to SREB. It's being reviewed by NC SARA staff and SREB staff, and it's expected to go to the SREB SARA steering committee for review within the next couple of months, no later than June. 
For Massachusetts, the Sarah State regulations were published Friday, March 23rd. The Massachusetts Department of Higher Education is currently creating a website and an online application system for their institutions. NIBI anticipates receiving their application in the coming months. For, as far as California goes, more and more California institution administrators are sharing their frustration at California not being, part, not being a SARA state and asking how they can participate and help move the process forward. The tone of recent conversations with key stakeholders is encouraging, but we have not yet seen tangible steps toward drafting legislation for the fall. Consumer advocates continue to express concern about allowing for-profit institutions to participate in SARA. However, there is increasing recognition that the value of SARA increases if the federal government backs away from the Obama-era regulations and student protections. Next slide, please. As of the end of March, the beginning of April, we now have 1,788 institutions participating in SARA, and we anticipate this number will continue to grow uh, for at least another year. We have very few institutions deciding not to renew, and generally if an institution decides not to renew, it's an issue related to an institutional merger, or they're simply re redesigning their distance education department and both online as well as their clinical placements and, and experiential learning placements, and they are stepping out for a year. Next slides. The distribution of size of institutions participating has remained fairly constant to these percentages since the very beginning. You can see that the greatest number, 45%, are institutions that have smaller than 2,500 student FTEs. And then the next group would be the group of institutions that have an FTE of students between 2,500 and 9,999. Next slide. Institutional sector makeup has also remained very close to this, these numbers. It varies perhaps one or two percent every quarter when we run these in. And, but it's been very consistent that the largest number of institutions participating are by far the public institution and then the private not-for-profit institutions. There is one tribal institution participating in the Wichita region. Next slide. Ah, now we're getting to the enrollment data. First of all, I want to point out that the last year's, re last year's report is available on the NCSARA website. And there are two reports. One of them is the 27 enrollment data report. And the second one is the 2017 iPads and SARA data comparison report. Both of these are available on the NCSARA website. And they're listed under the document section development documents, and then 2017. Last year, we had a total of 1,477 institutions that reported, and you can see the number of enrollments that were included in that report. Uh, we were very pleased with the increase in institutions that were support that were reporting last year, and so we're, we're aware that institutions are becoming more aware of this requirement and also with the comfort level of doing this reporting. Next slide. This year's report, uh, data reporting will be May 21st to June 11th. All SARA institutions are required to participate if they are a SARA institution as of May 21st. The guides are now available on the website and we've really worked really hard to expand the FAQ section on the enrollment data. This year, there are actually two options for reportings. One is a requirement, and that is the regular 2018 enrollment data reporting, which everyone has done in the past. And then the second one will be an optional 
learning placement reporting. In addition, the data sharing agreement is available on the NCSARA website and institutions will complete, will click the box that they have read that as part of this, the data sharing process and then that moves forward and then they can have uh, the additional information. This is the same as last year and it shouldn't be a surprise to any of the institutions that participated last year. It's simply the verification that it's a transparency document actually that NC Sarah uses so everybody knows where the data is going and what's going on and how it will be used and what gets posted. About it. Mary, this is Megan. Sorry to jump in. We're um, having a little trouble hearing you. If you could please speak a little louder. Thank you. I will. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry about that. Um, so the guides are the guides are available on the website as well as the data sharing agreement. And you can see exactly where they're located on the website. And um, also on this web website is a sample placement reporting matrix that we'll talk about in the second half of the of the conversation today but I want to make sure everybody saw where exactly they could download this information on this screen you can also see the documents title across the top of the website page and it's under that section that you can find the 2017 uh, reporting documents and, and the enrollment reports Next slide. The enrollment data itself screen that institution enter is looks like this. You would have the institution name and then you would simply list the number of students that were that was reported in each of the states. Now you will note that in the past, institutions sometimes listed zero if there were less than 10 students. That is no longer the case. As it was last year, institutions list the actual number of students that were participating in online, 100% online activity for the states. Now, let me be clear. There's a, the first option is the institutions would use the numbers that were reported to IPEDS, and then it would simply be disaggregated by states. If an institution does not report to IPEDS for some reason, then they will use the 100% online students from out of state. When I say from out of state, I mean from the activity taking place out of state. So if, it, if an institution reports to IPEDS, those numbers are disaggregated by state and those numbers are entered here regardless of the size. If an institution does not report to IPEDS, then they would calculate the number in a similar fashion to what IPEDS does. One thing to keep in mind is that this year, the state's portal entities will be notified halfway through the reporting period that their institutions have not reported if, and which ones have reported. Uh, last year, some of the institutions did not report. There were only a handful, but it's re important for the states to that they too are aware of this information, which is generated in the reports, and they want to make sure that all their institutions are reporting. So that's why we will be notifying all the state portal entities halfway through the reporting period, which institutions have not reported. If an institution is entering all zeros for some reason, they must explain why they are entering all zeros. If an institution enters all zeros without an explanation in the comment box, which is not visible on the screen, it's on page two, then they will be considered as not reporting. So please keep in mind that if you're entering all zeros, that you will enter a reason why. It could be 
that that's you know we want to make sure that's what you reported to iPads, and there are many options. Okay, um, just trying to make sure that everybody is clear on that. If you don't enter all zeros unless it's really all zeros, and then just make sure to explain why. Mary, I'm going to ask you to speak up again, please. Okay. I stood up, so hopefully this is better. Um, next slide. If, if, one more. Uh, back one. The institutions, you will go ahead and enter the information for the non sara states, just as you have done in the past. And this information will be aggregated and displayed as one number as a non sara state and territory total. But this information is required as well. Next slide. This is the enrollment data FAQ section. And as you can tell, it has been expanded greatly from last year. I want you to be sure to review the FAQ section in the guide before we So if you're we get back to all of the questions and if the institution can find the information available in the FAQ section first, that allows us to address other institutional questions that are not in the manual. One of the really things, big things you could do to help us when you send us a question is to make sure that you include your name, the institution, and the state of the institution. That allows us to get directly back to you and spend less time checking, uh, looking at that information and verifying uh, who you are based on an email address. Next question, the next page. I want to take a moment and talk about some of the questions that we get the most current, currently, as we're gearing up for the enrollment period. The first one we get is, do I just joined Sarah or I joined just last month, do I have to submit enrollment data? Yes, all institutions participating in Sarah effective May 21st are required to report enrollment data. What do I report? As I mentioned earlier, your IPEDS data submitted broken down by state. If not an IPEDS reporting institution, Report the number of 100% online students participating outside the state of the institution. Next slide. The most common question that we have received is, I need to update our institutional contact information. Can you do that for me? Unfortunately, no, we cannot do that. That information has to be updated through your Sarah Strait portal entity. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that if the state is aware of any change that happens at the institutional level, because they're going to be your first line of contacts, and they are also responsible for the institutional activity. And if they need to reach out to someone, and they don't have the current information, it slows down their process as well. If you don't know where to find this information, it's located on the NCSARA website under contacts and then state portal entity contacts. Next section, next page. The, the links to the reporting sections will not be mailed until May 21st. 
Military students living in another country, you do not report their information. You would report military students based on the location of the learning activity, the same as all other students. In other words, you don't report military students based on an APO address. You report where the learning activity takes place as you would with any other student. If you have not received the link to the data reporting guide sections by May 22nd, what should you do? The first thing to do is to follow up with your state portal to verify you are listed as one of the contacts for your institution and that your email address is entered correctly. The second thing to do is to send an email to data at ncsara.org with your name, institution name, and institution state, your email address, and let us know you did not receive the links. Excuse me, Mary. Before I move on to this, I think people are also uh, curious about where they, some of them aren't as familiar with the website. So perhaps I can share that with them while you're putting your headset on. Maybe that will help some of the background noise. And I'll give them the um, website that they can find um, many of these tools. OK. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, what I was sharing with everyone is that what Mary has referred to, and, and uh, you may have seen and you saw in your documents, is that the NC SARA website can be found at wwwnc Sarah, S -A -R -A, dot org, and you'll find the things that Mary has been referring to on the left-hand side of the home page, a lot of the documents that refer to the um, data collection and reporting. You can find those documents there, and uh, those will help you, and, and review of those will coincide with the information that you're hearing here that Mary is clarifying that are part of those documents. Okay, Mary, you, you good there with your headset? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, okay. there we go. So we are, if, are you looking for the next, would you like the next slide or would you like to stay with the military students? Are you... um, let's go ahead and go to the next, next slide. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let me just say that if you have not received the link by May 22nd, that's when you would reach out to NC Sarah and let us know. All of the contacts for an institution will receive the reporting links from NC Sarah. One of the things that will be helpful in advance is that is at the institutional level, if you decide who will do the actual submission of the reporting data, because everyone will be receiving the link. Let's talk a little bit about learning placement. Learning placement is not only experiential learning activities, there are clinical rotations, the student teaching, the internships, and those types of things. And they're really important parts of many instructional programs. You think about education, your teacher education, those don't happen with, generally without some student teaching going on. They occur in many disciplines, but they are particularly common in certain fields such as health-related disciplines and education. And often those are the ones that are requiring a professional licensure. This reporting is optional for 2018. There is a blog about the 2018 reporting requirements that you can find on the NC, section, NC Sarah website under the blog section, but also I will be going over much of that now. And all of it is available in the reporting placement guide. Next slide. Cheryl, can you confirm this is better? Yes, there was some um, background noise that I think is eliminated through a headset. Uh, yes, it was the train going by. 
Well, I think there was even some other kind of just kind of background noise. So I think a headset okay. works. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, most institutions, the majority of placements are made through academic programs that are likely located in the same state. Many academic programs cross state lines and making such placements, institutions are obliged to comply with relevant laws, rules, and regulations of the state in which placements are made. Rules and regulations on such matters may be those of the state education agency or come from a professional licensure board located in a particular state. Enrollments captured and reported under the provisions do not include on the ground out-of-state learning placements. Even though these activities are important parts of many academic programs and the numbers and the extent of such placements are of great interest and concern to educators, licensing bodies, and state regulators. So that's one of the reasons that we are collecting this information. The second reason is that during the development of SARA, parties agreed to work towards having SARA collect this information. And so we want to make sure that honor the things that we have said we would do from the very beginning. Next slide. What exactly constitutes a learning placement? There are very many different types of placements and definitions of placements. What we're going to be using is the definition for the NC Sarah reporting. NC SARA does not intend to have institutions identify and capture all such possible activities, such as short courses or field trips. Only the things that meet the following guidelines. The placement is outside the home state of the SARA institution. The placement involves the physical presence of the student at an out-of-state location. The placement is an activity required for degree completion or professional licensure. The placement is carried out under the provisions of a formal agreement between the institution and the placement location, and the placement started between January 1st, 2017 and December 31st, 2017. Next slide. Replacements that meet the above criteria should be reported as follows. Unduplicated headcount, disaggregated by two-digit CIP code, and disaggregated by the state in which the placement was made. So what exactly does that mean? Well, if you had three, uni three University of Texas nursing students doing a single clinical rotation at each of two hospitals in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and one rotation at the hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, UTP would report three placements in New Mexico and three placements in Arizona, all under the CIP code of 51. So what exactly is a CIP code? And Please go to the next slide. The CIP code is very much like a subject matter section. And each institution has already a CIP code associated with their degree programs. It's going to vary. Can you back up one slide? It will vary by uh, each institution, but there should be some similarities. We have listed the CIP codes by name to make it easier for institutions to select the type, which is the subject, as opposed to simply listing a number such as 51. So the institution would go in and, in this case, the institution of the South, would list, they have selected construct, construction trades as the CIP code, 
The state is Alabama and they have 23 students that are placed in Alabama. On the right hand side of the box, lower left hand side, you see add another CIP state enrollment. So you, an institution would click on that box. Next screen. And here you can see where, back up there. Here you can see where they've added engineering and they have 44 students in the state of Georgia. Next slide. Here we have actually the table of contents from the FAQ, including the FAQs for the learning placement guide. Again, we've tried to answer many of the questions, but we know that we have missed some. So I, again, I just want to reiterate not to hesitate to ask us questions that we may have forgot to list. Next slide. We have some that we've received some of the same types of questions regarding the learning placement that we had from the regular enrollment reporting. The first one is regarding military students. Again, no, you report military students based on the location of the learning activity, the same as all other students and you would not report military students living in other countries. Um, we've discussed how you can find the institutional contact to update the institutional information. Next question, slide. The e as I've mentioned earlier, the reporting links will be mailed on May 21st. And at this time, it looks like you'll have links to both reporting websites. And the first one is required and it will be labeled as the regular en enrollment reporting. And the second one is this, the learning placement reporting section. A question that has become common and that we've tried to address is what is an out-of-state learning experience? An out-of-state learning experience refers to an internship, externship, clerkship, practicum, rotation, clinical, student teaching, independent study, study way, and the like that occurs in the United States district, territory, district or territory outside the state of the institution. But again, you want to remember that you only report those if they meet the five requirements that we mentioned earlier. Next slide. What is a formal agreement? The majority of agreements will be in writing, whether it's a contract, an MOU, an MOA, or something of that nature. Some institutions may have verbal agreements. If your institution considers only written documents to be formal agreements, then only written documents would be your formal agreement. I would suggest checking with your attorney or contract administrator if you have any questions about what constitutes a formal agreement. Next slide. Learning placements. Another common question that we're getting is on, do I report an internship? The answer to this is yes, it depends. But only those meeting the five requirements that we mentioned earlier. In other words, the, the placement is outside the home state it involves physical presence of the student at an out-of-state location. The placement activity is required for degree completion or professional licensure. 
In other words, the internship would be requirement. It would not be an optional situation that a student has set up by themselves to do in the summer. This is an internship that's required for the degree or for professional licensure. There's a formal agreement in place and it happens between January 1st and January 2017. Another question that we're, we're hearing is, do I report replacement data for all programs or just distance education programs? You would report placement data for all programs because you're placing not just distance education students, you're, you're placing all students in a placement program, in a placement. Next slide. I want to also mention that we anticipate having a session at the WTEC conference to get feedback on the learning placement reporting. And until that time, we welcome any kind of comments or questions you have. I'd like to take the time to thank WCET, San, Megan, and Cheryl specifically for the support of this webinar. And I've gone through this fairly quickly in order to answer, to allow time to answer some of the questions that may be out there. Well, that's great, Mary. Thank you so much for going through this. Um, I, I think that probably what we'll see is that if folks have a chance to review the materials that are available on the NC Sarah website, that it will, that in conjunction with your um, presentation will give them a lot of the answers that they need. Um, one thing I do want to uh, make sure everyone's aware is that we will be sending out the uh, link for the recording. So you can get the slides from the handout section and we will be sending the link to the recording um, to all the registrants. And it will also be posted on the NC Sarah website and on WCET. Um, shortly, so you will have access to it from a multiple locations. But let's go to some questions. Um, but could you reiterate, Mary, is that reporting on two-digit or six-digit CIP codes? It is on two-digit CIP code. And on the NC Sarah website, you remember when I was showing the picture about where the guides are, guides are located, there is a spreadsheet that we have developed that includes all the CIP codes in all the states. So for an individual who is tasked with doing this reporting, they could take that enrollment sample, enrollment placement sample, distribute it to the different colleges and have them complete that and then get that back to you. But it is done by two digit CIP codes at this time. We looked at six digit, but that will that would create a very large matrix for institutions to work with. And because it's really the pilot year, we thought doing a two digit to get started would be the way to go. Great. And that's the first two digits, correct? Correct. Great. OK, the next question we have has to do a lot with tracking. And I know that's something with the State Authorization Network. We talk quite a bit. Um, but I'm going to address this to you, Mary. Um, this is a, a discussion that has happened at this institution about how to build a query for students who are out of state. Um, the, the institution uh, contact here has said, historically, they have selected only those students who do not live in a local in-state address on file since we don't know where exactly students may be or may not know where they are when they are enrolled in the course. Is this acceptable? Unfortunately for the institution, the answer to that is no. The reason the answer is no is that if an institution does not know where the student is actually taking their course and or doing a learning activity, they are not aware of one, where they may be triggering physical presence in another state, and two, for the purposes of professional licensure, that student and the institution may not be in agreement on whether or not they are able to sit for a professional licensure or certification in a state since they 
institution was not aware of where the student activity was taking place. Uh, the SAN website has several examples, um, and Cheryl, you can speak to this, about institutions doing a really great job of tracking their students. One of the most common is to have institutions ask each quarter, semester, or term where the student is, is the location of the student's presence for the learning activity. In other words, the institution may be located in Montana, the mailing address may be in Oregon, but the student might actually be doing the activity in Washington. And the in, that's very critical information for the institution for the purposes of physical presence and state authorization, professional licensure, and disclosures. Great. Thanks for explaining that, Mary. So it's not only where an online course, where students participating in an online course, the student could be part of a face-to-face -face program, but be participating in an experiential learning um, opportunity in another state. And you would want to know where that is as well. The institution will want to know. Okay. Great. Yes. Thank right. you. That was a good question. Um, uh, the, another question has to do with, um, you were referring to where, um, oh, uh, that's what it was. You, you were referring to what types of institutions are members of, of SARA or are participating in SARA. And the question is, um, are there currently any for-profits that are participating in SARA? Yes, there are some for-profits that are participating, and it's roughly 6%. Okay, great. Um, I think there is another question about what is mandatory versus voluntary reporting for this reporting session? The mandatory reporting is the enrollment reporting that has been done the past two years and that I talked about to begin with. That's uh, the only one that's mandatory. The voluntary is the learning placement reporting where they're tracking the students that are in a learning placement situation as opposed to an insta the iPads numbers or the 100% online student. Okay. And is SARA reporting required for an institution that has only part-time enrollments? Yes. Okay. And let's see, the next question how should we report armed forces location? I'm sure there's a different answer for out of country versus in country, um, but the person would like to know, how should they report armed forces locations? You do not report out of country location because Sarah is only focused on, is, is an agreement only among the states. As far as in country, you would use the location of the student, just like you would for any other student. Okay, and our next question is, um, this institution became a participating institution in 2018. Do they still report 2017 data? Yes, they would use the same data that they reported for iPads in fall of 2017. Uh, let's see. The next question is 100% online. Does that mean not taking any other method of instruction? Yes. Okay. Okay. Those are good. Yes. Okay. And um, the, this person, this next person would like to know, what about online students in their home state? Is there anything that needs to be done about um, reporting that? No, we are only reporting, the institutions are only reporting activity outside their state. If a student is on campus or in the state doing their distance education or their placement activity, those numbers are not reported. Your institution is reporting out of state. Because part of this is at, remember, I mentioned the agreement that w was reached when Sarah was developing to make sure that other state regulators are aware of the activity in their state. Okay. Uh, 
we have a question about the z reporting zeros. Do you have to explain when you have all zeros in reporting? Yes, because having all zeros in the reporting without having some sort of comment, and it could be simply that we only have part-time students, it will appear to both the state portal entity and to NC Sarah that the institution simply went in and put in all zeros rather than completing the reporting requirement. Okay. Uh, this question is, okay, so we report our iPads numbers regarding what we reported for online only. That is correct. Okay. The next question, if a student takes two courses, do you report that as two or one since it is the same student taking two courses? I'm, um, you would report the student as one because it's if he was taking both courses in one state for the enrollment reporting. Okay. Am I my assumption is that that's what the question is addressed to, is the enrollment reporting. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, again, asks about, do you report about the state you are located in, your home state? Do you report your home state? Uh, no. No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we reiterated no. that. You have... You have the option on the learning, re on the learning placement, I believe, but it's not a requirement. If you wanted to track it for your own personal information, that would be a great opportunity to do so, but it's not a requirement at this time. Okay. Um, let's see. If the institution does not disaggregate data to iPads, but the information can be run from another means, is that okay? That is correct. That's fine. Okay. And uh, the person would also like clarifications about the dates for data collection are, could you repeat those dates? The data collection uh, period will open May 21st and it runs through June, I'm flipping, flipping June 11th. Okay. Uh, let's see, the next question, if the school is low residency, will we fill out zero for all states since the student did not participate 100% from that particular state? That particular participant has um, left. Maybe we can get in touch with her and get some clarification on that question. I, I would like to do that um, as I have several questions that popped to mind before I, if, I don't want to get the wrong information right. until I have a few Perfect. details. Okay. Let's see. Our online learning students all come to campus for the first week of each semester. Our registrar states that iPad stresses that students reported as online learners are only learning online. His interpretation is that the first week for each semester when our online learners are on campus disqualifies them to be counted as on online learners. As such, he reported as zeros for many of our students. And so I and so they're wondering, do they do the same? Is this correct or incorrect? They would report the same numbers that were reported to iPads. And in that case, if they had all zeros, I would hope the institution would go ahead and provide that information that it was because the registrar had made the determination that the weak orientation on campus disqualified the iPads reporting as an online student. Okay. Um, this person has a question. As a confirmation, we're being asked for the activity location, not the home address reported. So if they are taking classes while vacationing for a quarter in Florida, but home address is California, we report Florida? That is correct. Okay. What about students who are not fully online students, but are completing 
four credit internships and taking an online internship supervisory super, supervisory course um, in Sarah various states would we be should they be counted in data reporting? So they're taking four credit internships in other Sarah states. They would they would be reported probably in the placement. Well, the location of the placement because it's out of state. Because it's out of state. Uh, someone asked about where, okay, we got that. The FAQs can be found on the NC Sarah website as a part, because everyone should read the manual and they can find the FAQs within the manual. Am I correct there, Mary? Right. The, both guides have a section of FAQs. Okay. If we are completing our renewal application for institutional participation in Sarah, do we need the renewal application or must we also include the interregional guidelines for the evaluation, the CRAC guidelines, um, as we submitted with our initial application. This isn't really about a data situation, Mary, so I, I'm sorry I didn't preface that. This is about the renewal application. So would you like me to repeat it? Uh, the renewal application, if it has the CRAC guidelines attached to it, you would submit the whole package to your state portal entity. Great. Uh, somebody asked which iPad survey do they use, the fall enrollment or the 12-month enrollment? The fall enrollment. Okay. Please. Several people asked the same thing. They were concerned about that. Uh, if not reporting to iPad, do you take a snapshot of who is enrolled on a certain date or specific fall term? That would be acceptable. Okay. Uh, here we have about hybrid programs. They have hybrid programs and they have students that may take some of their courses fully online, but others are half online, half on campus. Do you include these students in the enrollments? You would not include those in the data enrollment because they are not 100% online at this time and those numbers are not reported to IPEDS. Okay, and the next question, could you uh, explain a little bit about the military reporting or reiterate um, the situation with um, managing military location? The military students would be counted just like a regular student is based on the location of the activity, not based on the address or the tuition classification. Great. Um, I'm reading through these. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there, if you have not been received the link, Mary, you spoke of a link um, to that they would be receiving. If they didn't receive the link, what is the address that they can email address that they can email to request the link? The, uh, the links have not been mailed out and will not be mailed out until May 21st. Okay. But if, if they do not have if they do not receive that, then the first thing they would do would be to contact their state portal entity to make sure they are listed as the institutional contact. And then if they have, they're listed as the institutional contact, correct address, email address, then they would send a note to data at ncsara.org. Great. Now, uh, back to military students a second. Uh, this is this may have happened when we had little audio issues. Um, did you mention something specifically about special requirements from Department of Defense um, and something in particular for a, a July one um, situation for military students that we should address? No, I did not mention anything ab about that. But since there are so many things up in the air regarding the July one possibilities, uh, we are we are not worried about that right now since this reporting is based on the fall 2017 at ipads data and and probably to reiterate what you just said too about military students that you would be um counting the military students just like other students correct 
Uh, and could you please review where a person would update the campus contact information? Where should they do that? They, they would update their contact information through their state portal entity. And the staff for each of the states can be found at. Sorry, that's the alarm. Uh, the state information can be found on the NCSARA website under contacts. There is a section listed for state portal entities, and there's a drop down menu of all the states listed there. Great. Okay. Um, well, at this time, I am seeing that we're five minutes to the top of the hour, and there are a number of questions, and I want everyone to feel comfortable knowing that we are, are keeping these questions. I can. Um, I will be sharing this with Mary and uh, we will go back over the questions and we will make sure that those questions are answered. So we find them very valuable and we thank you for putting them into the question box. So we will address them and they will be posted on the NC Sarah website um, and uh, we'll find a place on the WCET website as well. And, um, and uh, we'll move from there. So you can look for those soon. Uh, you will also be able to uh, have access to this recording um, within a week. So you'll see that posted on the site and those that registered will receive the link um, via email. So at this time, I want to thank Mary very much for going through this. I think that it would be really valuable for everyone to go back and read the materials that, um, that Mary was referencing that you can find on the home page of the NC Sarah website. And then it will correspond to the things that Mary's been talking about. So Mary, do you have any parting words before we turn it back over to Megan? We thank you very much uh, for being here. Well, thank you very much for for the work that you and Megan have done to make this possible. And I so apologize for the audio issues at the beginning. Oh, no problem. These things uh, do happen and we work with them. And uh, so, um, Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Let's go ahead and move through the next several slides. So again, we, well, we address the questions. The State Authorization Network has many, many valuable workshops coming up and they will have a meeting in conjunction with the WCET annual meeting. But take note of these events and programs here. If you're not familiar with the State Authorization Network, reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide more information to you. Next slide. The WCET website also has a lot of valuable resources. If you are new to our organization, be sure to visit the website and click on Join WCT to learn more about how you can get connected with the organization. And moving along, we have several uh, interesting programs coming up. One is our Leadership Summit, which will be in Newport Beach, California in early June. And the topic this year is ensuring ethical and equitable access in digital learning. And our annual meeting, as I mentioned, is in Portland this year. We are accepting program proposals, which there is a state authorization track or topic that, that we will be sure to feature. So submit a proposal by May 7th. And lastly, I just want to thank the WCET supporting members and our sponsors that underwrite much of our programs and events here at WCET and help us put on webcasts such as this. So again, thank you for your incredibly thoughtful questions. We had a, a lot of participation today, so we will be weeding through those questions and then post those responses. So again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to Cheryl. Thank you to Mary. And thank you for being part of this discussion. We'll see you on the next WCET webcast.